So my name is Martin Kleppmann, um, and I'd like to start with a confession, which is that I actually don't know very much about DDD at all. And so, uh, I, so I'm, I'm really kind of badly placed to be speaking here. Um, but my background is in building systems, large-scale data systems for internet companies. And uh, so I've done a bunch of research in that area and built various production systems as well. At the moment, I'm on the academic side at the University of Cambridge, looking at some of the more fundamental parts of, of building large-scale, scalable data systems. Um, and I'm writing this book here for O'Reilly, which looks at the architecture of the systems used by internet companies. And so as part of the research for this book, I've kind of been giving conference talks and writing blog posts and exploring various ideas to see how people respond to them. And uh, especially I've been talking about building systems that use events at their core. And people keep coming to me and saying, this looks a bit like event sourcing. How is it different? And so my first reaction was, what is event sourcing? I've never heard of it. And they replied to me saying, oh, it's a concept from domain-driven design. You should look at it. And I go, what the hell is domain-driven design? Because in this kind of community of people that, uh, that I've come from, actually, this is a completely unknown thing. Barely anybody knows about DDD at all. Um, and perhaps that's actually OK, because if I look at the kind of systems that I've worked on, actually, the business domain hasn't been particularly complicated. So generally, these are probably not really situations that need DDD, that would benefit from DDD. That doesn't mean that they're easy. It's just that the complexities and the hard aspects are elsewhere. And so I'd like to draw this dichotomy here, which is it's maybe a bit of a false dichotomy, but I think it'll serve for purposes of making an argument, uh, between enterprise software on the one side and the systems of internet companies on the other side. Of course, in reality, you may well find both within the same organization. So they're, they're not really that mutually exclusive. Um, but the main distinction I want to make here is that on the enterprise software side, it seems to me that uh, the main problem, the biggest problem that software faces there is the complexity of the domain. And of course, this is why DDD exists. It's in order to give us tools to deal with that complexity and manage it. Uh, so this is complexity in the business logic that we try to manage. On the other hand, in the, the kind of internet infrastructure domain, the problem is not so much the complexity of domain. The domain can be quite simple. The problem, the biggest problem, is that there's simply so much data. There's vast volumes of data, and it's coming in at really high speed. And so that leads to complexity of the data infrastructure. So simply the, the servers and the infrastructure in order to handle that onslaught of data become complexity. And so we've got complexity on both sides, but for very different reasons. And what I found surprising is that it seemed that the solutions to managing this complexity actually have some similarity across these two domains. And that's, so the, that's really the main point I want to make here, that, uh, well, as part of DDD, event sourcing has become like one way of structuring data where we say, OK, we can describe the state of a system, not in terms of mutation to some like mutable data store, but in terms of the sequence of changes that led to the current state of the system. And each of these changes is an immutable event that is stored somewhere. On the other side, on the um, internet company side, this is what I've mostly worked on, is stream processing systems, which also deal with sequences of immutable events. And so what I'd like to do here is first illustrate some examples of stream processing from my experience of the systems that I've worked on. Uh, and then we can see some of the parallels. And maybe there's something that we can learn from each other here. Um, because I think it's very good to try and connect different communities. That's why I'm, I'm coming here in the hope that maybe there's some interesting things that I can bring from the internet infrastructure side of things. But likewise, I'd like to learn from DDD and see what I can carry back to the infrastructure side as well. So um, I worked at LinkedIn until about a year and a half ago or so. So I'd like to take an example for, that is actually taken from LinkedIn production systems and the workflow that I worked on. And uh, you can imagine LinkedIn has rather a lot of data, and a lot of it is in the structure of events. And one example event that, of which there is quite a lot is a page view event, or in uh, the kind of past tense verb nomenclature, you might call that user viewed page or such like. So this is a, an event that is generated any time a user views a page on the website or in the mobile app. 
And so a typical event looks something like this. It's got a type, it's got a timestamp, like a Unix timestamp. Uh, it's got the ID of the user who, who viewed the page. It's got maybe a session ID, which might have come from a session cookie, which tells you which browser is doing that. It's got a page key or a URL, which tells you which page was viewed. In this case, maybe one user viewed another user's profile. OK, so in that case, you might want to log also the ID of the profile that was viewed. So now we've got a relationship between two different profiles. And you might log a few other things, like, for example, how did the user get to that page in the first place? Did they click a link in an email? Did they click a push notification? Did they come from the search feature on the website? Whatever. And if you have these events, collecting them is rather useful. You can do many interesting things with it. For example, LinkedIn has this feature called Who Viewed Your Profile, which you might have seen. It uh, gives you this kind of dashboard view of like a summary Google Analytics style of all of the people who viewed your profile in the last few months. And it tells you like how many per week have viewed your profile. And it gives you some uh, happy smiling faces of some of the people who viewed your profile and various other stats there. So that's one thing you can do. You can also build recommendation systems. This is something that LinkedIn is quite big on, is trying to use machine learning systems to build recommendations that help the people of the site, using the site. So one simple feature there, for example, is people who viewed profile X also viewed profile Y. This is called collaborative filtering in the jargon. So if you know all of the data about who viewed which profile, you can start building these kind of features here, where if you look at my profile on the side, you get this little box suggesting various other profiles of people who are in some way related to me. And with this event, many more things you can do, right? Okay, so you can train relevance models for search, for example, so that you rank search results in an order that's useful to people. You can monitor the performance of the site. You can evaluate the results of A-B tests to see if you made some change to the site. Does it improve metrics or not? You can use it for reporting to management, and so on, and so on. So I just want to focus on one of these examples here and how we might implement that. And this example is this who viewed your profile. So zooming in a bit on that screenshot from earlier, that's what's the data. Like This is the, the read view onto the collection of page view events. All of the views for a particular profile, but that might be a fairly large number. So it gets summarized into these, OK, there's a bucket per week, and we have a counter per week. Um, but also, we have some interesting things like it broke down, OK, 70 of the people who viewed my profile have a job title of software developer. OK, that's kind of makes sense because I'm also a software developer and lots of them uh, work at LinkedIn, OK. But if you think about the structure of this event we had earlier here, there's nothing here telling us what the job title of the software developer, uh, what the job title of the viewer is. It just gives us the ID of the viewer, which is enough to identify it. But at some point, some kind of join has got to happen here so that we can take an event that contains only a view ID, viewer ID and somehow enrich that so that we also have the job title and also have the company name for the viewer of that event. And then once we have that, we can index it and aggregate it and create these kind of snippets of information like how many of the people who viewed your profile have a certain job title. So there's clearly some kind of multi-step process that has to happen here. And this is where stream processing comes in. So you could imagine like a simple option might be to log the events with all of this additional denormalized data in the first place. Uh, but then these events would get really large. Um, and you'd have to stuff into, into those events all sorts of things that might be needed for some kind of purposes in future. So in general, it seems to be better, and this is what LinkedIn does as well, is just to keep the raw events as clean and simple as possible. And if you need to join with some additional data sets, then do that as a separate step, as an enrichment step. And so with a stream processor, you would do this somehow like this. You have some kind of stream of page view events happening that's live on the site. Every time a user loads some page, some web server emits this event and dumps it on a message queue of some sort. And then you have some kind of job which sits there consuming those events. And it somehow has to add the profile information about the viewer to these events. And so, well, the obvious way of doing that is to query a database. So every time you get an event, like with view ID 1234, you query that database, can I please have the profile for 1234, and you get it back. And then you emit a composite event where, with that profile data included. And so 
the way that works, uh, you can think of as a join between the stream of events, the, pro, the, the page view events, and a table of data, uh, the, the, the table of user profiles, where every time for every element in the stream, you do a lookup in that table, and then you generate the output somehow. The problem here is a performance problem, mainly. And that is that these uh, event streams can be quite high volume. And we've built efficient systems for dealing with high volume streams. So the stream processing system that I worked on would handle hundreds of thousands of messages per node. And so distributed across multiple machines, you can get throughput of millions of messages per second. But if you're going to do that kind of query volume to a database, uh, you, your database is not going to be particularly happy in most cases. And so there seems to be like a, at least two orders of magnitude throughput difference between the rate at which we can sensibly query a database and the rate at which these events are coming in. So that's simply a bit too slow. OK, when things are too slow, the standard approach is, OK, we add caching, because caching makes everything faster, doesn't it? And now you have two problems, of course. Uh, you have the cache invalidation problem. Um, and so that's the problem there is that, well, at some point, somebody will update their profile. And so this cache might be stale. And now you say, OK, well, you know, for the purpose of analytics, we don't care too much if the, if the profile is a little bit stale. So you know, what do you do here? Do you have some kind of invalidation time, like maybe keep an expiry of one day in that cache, so that way the data won't be more stale than one day? But it's a really difficult trade-off, because if you make that expiration time too short, then OK, you've got up-to-date profiles, but the cache isn't giving you much benefit, because most of the request to the cache will be misses. Uh, but if you make the expiration too long, then you've got really stale data. OK, and there's actually a more insidious problem there as well, despite just the staleness of the data. And that problem is illustrated in this graph. It might be a bit hard to see from the back, I'm afraid, but I'll just explain it. So this is a uh, graph over the course of 12 hours for, on the x-axis um, of queries per second to one of LinkedIn's production database clusters. And you can see that this is kind of daytime. So during this time, it's about 67,000 requests per second. And it's fairly stable there. And then evening comes. And towards the evening, it kind of goes down. And then at about 5.30 PM, the throughput suddenly drops to almost 0. And it stays at almost 0 for about half an hour. And then after half an hour, there's a huge spike. And the number of queries per second spikes up to about 24,000 per second. So that's like three or four times the normal daytime peak traffic, which is kind of not that nice to the database. So what has happened here? What happened here was that, well, we had a stream processing job, which was taking in these page view events. And that stream processing job got shut down for half an hour because you know it's not a particularly critical job. It's just generating some analytics, which don't need to be super up to date. And so it's OK for it to be down for half an hour. Then after half an hour, after the maintenance is over, it's restarted again. And now this job wants to catch up on all of the events that it missed while it was shut down. And so it churns through that whole backlog as fast as it can. And we've built these systems to be quite efficient. So it can churn, churn through all of these backlog of events pretty quickly. But as a result, it's hammering this database really hard. And now some completely unrelated part of the system, which is also happens to be talking to this database, suddenly goes really slow. And suddenly, we've impacted users. Um, by doing some what we thought was routine maintenance somewhere in the back end. So this is pretty bad news. So what we want to do is build these kind of stream table joins, but we want to do so in a way that uh, doesn't make us cause lots of operational problems. And so I was talking a bit about this cache and the cache invalidation earlier. And well, rather than having just an expiry time on the cache, we say, OK, we could have a, some kind of active invalidation policy that is, most of the time, people don't update their LinkedIn profile that often. You know, like you might update it every few months at most, maybe every few years. And so uh, in this case, actually, we can just afford to take the changes. And whenever a change to a profile happens, then we update the cache. And otherwise, we just leave it there in the cache long term. So somehow, we need some kind of mechanism for detecting changes to people's profiles. So we need some kind of stream of profile changes. We could call that, say, a profile change event or a profile edit event. And this, this is probably like horrendous for, from you from a DDD point of view. But like this is just as a first draft, how you might structure that kind of event is, OK, you could say that at some point, 
somebody changed their profile and their old location was London, their new location is Brussels, and they changed their industry as well. Um, you could imagine maybe this should be two separate events, like a chain location changed event and a industry changed event or so. But the principle remains that somehow we've captured this change to the profile in an immutable event which we can stick on a stream. And now, if you've got this stream of events, these profile edit events, we can now feed that into a stream processor as well. I've just labeled this SAMSA here at the moment because that's the name of the particular system that I happen to work on. Um, but really, any stream processor will do this here. So you take this stream of events every time somebody updates their profile, and you write that to either invalidate your entry in the cache, or actually, you know, we might as well just call that a database, because at this point, we're kind of keeping a copy of the profiles database locally for, our, for the stream processing job, because this database now doesn't need to be shared with anybody else anymore. We assume that in this kind of event sourcing style of thinking, the stream of profile edit events contains all of the events that we might ever need in order to reconstitute the entire state of this profiles database. And so therefore, we can just say, OK, this is our own private copy of the profiles database. That's quite nice from an operational point of view. And now we've got the page view events, and that also feeds into the same, into the same stream processing task. And now it can query that database for the latest profile every time an event comes in, and then, of course, emits this uh, composite output event. So it looks not too different from what we had, except the big difference is now that this profiles database is not somewhere shared with various other systems, but it's our own private copy of the database, which means we can actually stick it inside the stream processor. In fact, we can put it in the same process, on the same operating system, on the same machine as the, the code handling the data. So we don't have a network hop for every single message lookup, which is great for the throughput, because the whole problem with this discrepancy of two orders of magnitude throughput difference is, well, you know, if you're making a database query over the network for every single message, well, that's just going to take some round trip times. Whereas here, we can actually embed this profile database right there inside the job. Um, and, you know, with that, this problem goes away. Because now, although uh, we still have this issue that the throughput goes down for a while and then spikes up, but the database that we're hammering is just local on the stream processing machines, so it's not affecting any of the rest of the system at all. So from an operational point of view, this is great. So this is kind of a way how we handle this sort of pattern of uh, a join of a uh, stream with table-like data, except the table is also expressed in the form of a stream of events, because that is what allows us to do this updating of the table whenever something changes. OK, so let's make this a bit more concrete. Um, I'll talk about one particular open source project that I've been involved with called Apache Kafka. So this was originally developed at LinkedIn for exactly this kind of purpose of um, aggregating logs and processing events. Um, it's now an open source project that the Apache Software Foundation is fairly widely used. And the principle it's built on is actually astonishingly simple. It's, it's actually very much like log files in your typical application server. You know, it'll output these plain text files which contain the log messages of, that were emitted somewhere within the code. And these files are append-only files which consist of records. Every record is like a line in the log, so the record separator is the new line character. And they contain whatever information this thing happens to want to log, like in a typical web server log, it might be some, some details like this. And you've just got this ordered sequence of records. And the way Kafka was intended to be used, the way it was initially designed, was actually very much for just taking log files across a whole fleet of different servers and bringing them together so that you can then feed them into analytic systems and for the recommendation systems that we talked about earlier, but also for operational purposes like tracking down where the errors are happening and such like. And so, you know, that on the whole, this is, this is kind of a fairly mundane but useful operational task to do. Uh, and the main thing that Kafka does is it does this kind of uh, aggregation of log files at a rather large scale. 
So the, the scale we're talking about here is like over a trillion events per day, uh, which is the, the rate at which LinkedIn is currently pumping data through Kafka. Um, Netflix is doing almost, a, yeah, almost the same rate of events and you know, Uber and Twitter and various other companies are similarly using Kafka at fairly large scale. Uh, so this kind of volume you obviously can't pump through a single machine because it's way more than a single network interface will allow you to, to push through it. So of course this is a distributed across multiple machines. Um, what it also does is replicate data across multiple machines so that when you lose one machine then another one can take over and you don't lose any data in the process. Um, and it tries really quite hard to not lose data. And so this kind of thing starts having sort of database-like characteristics already. So even though it's, it's not really a database, but uh, it stores all of its data on disk, keeps the history of all of these events for quite a long time. And so Kafka in general you know, is not just for these web ser server log events, but really in general streams of events where you know, the event could be anything that happened. It could be. Uh, like a web server log, an HTTP request literally happened. But uh, it could be kind of product level activity events which are used for tracking and analytics purposes like we talked about. It could also be kind of sensor style events where like once per minute you're measuring the CPU utilization of a server um, or like the temperature of a CPU core or whatever and just emit that as periodic events. And actually um, Kafka works pretty well for this style of event too, um, and is actually used for that too. But almost the most interesting one I see is these database change events. And that's where we get kind of closest to the world of event sourcing actually. And so this is really just another kind of event where, uh, like as we discussed, the, uh, the content of the event is some change that happened to data which might be expressed in sort of a low level before and after view or it might actually be an event sourcing, like a properly designed event describing the change that happened from a business logic point of view. But all of these deal with these streams of events where each event just describes the fact that something happened at some point in time, and that's an immutable fact. And now the way that Kafka works internally is actually rather like the Unix tool tail, if you've used that before. So you could do tail-f on a file, and it'll just follow the file for any things that are appended to the end of the file and print it out on the console whenever something is appended. And this is actually exactly how Kafka works, except it's distributed. It's like a distributed version of tail-f. So rather than having one file, we've actually got several files in parallel because that allows us to, to partition the whole thing across multiple machines. Um, but each of these is, at least conceptually, an append-only file of records. And so whenever somebody wants to publish a new message to Kafka, to the stream of messages or the stream of events, then it simply gets appended to the end of one of these files. And when, to, when you want to consume the stream of messages, what you have is, is like tail-f, each consumer has a current position into each of these partitions. And then it just sequentially reads from that position. And so because these messages, these events are totally ordered, we can say that, OK, each, each, each event in a partition has a sequence number, or an offset, as we call it. And the consumer simply points at, uh, at the offset that is the latest message that it has heard of. And then it knows, because it consumes the messages sequentially, all of the messages with a lower offset have already been processed. All of the messages with a higher offset have not yet been processed. So it simply iterates through the messages in a partition in a single threaded way. Now it makes it really simple to deal with because it just needs to periodically checkpoint its offset to stable storage somewhere and that way even if it crashes, starts up again, it can just resume processing at the point where it last was. However, um, uh, when, when the thing is split across multiple partitions, you have to keep a, an offset per partition. But the splitting across multiple partitions also helps with scaling again because if each individual partition is a single threaded consumer. You can have different partitions being consumed independently on different threads on different machines. And so that way you still get your parallelization. OK, and now if the type of data we're dealing with is this sort of database change event sourcing like data, 
then you can imagine each event being taken in and being written to an index. And this is somewhat like uh, when event sourcing talks about taking the events and applying them to an aggregate, which might just be an in-memory object, or it might actually be something that's persisted on disk somewhere. Um, that's what I'm talking about here. So a consumer simply takes the events on a partition, and over time, it just kind of more events get appended at the end, and as they get appended, the consumer takes them and applies them to its local version of this data. So it just kind of keeps moving forward in time there. At this point, it might be actually interesting to contrast Kafka with other types of messaging systems. So you're probably aware of AMQP or JMS-style message queues, which seem to kind of serve a similar purpose of you know, getting messages from some producers to some consumers. Um, and on that high level, they are similar, absolutely. The biggest difference with, um, between Kafka and these JMS AMQP style queues is to do with message acknowledgments. And so that is, how does the broker, or how does the system as a whole, know which consumer has successfully processed which message? So that if something crashes, you know which messages you have to replay. And as you're probably aware, the, the model in AMQP and JMS is that every time the broker delivers a message to a consumer, the consumer then has some time to process it. And eventually, once it's successfully processed, it, it'll acknowledge the message back to the broker. And that way, the broker knows, OK, tick, that message was successfully processed. I don't need to keep that message anymore. And occasionally, something fails. Like maybe a message was explicitly marked as failed for some reason. It crashed while processing. Uh, or like somebody pulled out the power on the machine, in which case it simply times out after a while. And what these message brokers do in this case is, well, of course, we don't want to simply lose messages. We have to make sure that every message is reliably delivered. So a failed message will get re-delivered. But the consequence of this re-delivery is now that the messages appear out of order, potentially, at the consumers. And now, in a kind of job queue use case, if you're, what you're trying to do is like the messages you're sending on the queue are requests to like, please can you send this email for me? Or please can you charge this credit card for me? It doesn't really matter too much in which order those things are processed. You know, as long as they all get done eventually, that's fine. And so for this job, type, job queue type use case, the AMQP and JMS style message queues are exactly what you want. Whereas for an event log, well, if you're describing the sequence of changes to some database, the ordering of those events is really important because you know, whether x was first set to 5 and then set to 6, or the other way around, first set to 6 and then set to 5, well, that makes quite a big difference for the final outcome, whether the final outcome is 5 or 6. Um, and so this type <coughs> event log is where you want to totally, totally preserve the ordering of the messages and make sure that everyone, all of the consumers, always see the messages in the same order. And this is the kind of world that Kafka lives in. So because for this reason, I don't really see Kafka as a competitor to JMS or AMQP style message queues at all. They really target totally different types of use cases. In fact, the Kafka type use case looks a lot more like database replication. So if you think about the typical master-slave replication, or I prefer, I prefer to call it leaders and followers, or primary, secondary, whatever you want to call it, what they do is they accept all of the writes on the leader database and then replicate this change, change stream uh, through either like a physical write ahead log that gets shipped over the network uh, or through logical change sets, logical change stream. This gets replicated over to the replicas. And the ordering, of course, of the events there is totally critical because what you want is that after, after all of the messages have been exchanged, all of the replicas are in the same state. That's the, the whole point of replication, is to have the copy of the same data on multiple machines. So this kind of order-preserving message streams look a lot like these kind of databases. Now, there's one very nice thing that uh, event sourcing talks about, which is this complete keeping a uh, complete history of all of the changes that have ever happened. Perhaps you make checkpoints and compact it down from time to time if it's in danger of getting too big. But conceptually, at least you have this full history. 
Uh, and the, what that means is that, of course, you can rebuild the state of something off that complete history of changes whenever you need to. And this is actually used quite effectively in Kafka-esque systems as well. So for example, we talked about this maintaining an index earlier. You could imagine this being, for example, a full text search index, actually. You know, for purposes of serving the search feature on your website, you've got to take all of the items that are in your database and somehow index them by keyword. And there's some databases which do full text search integrated into the same database engine as, as uh, like your typical OLTP storage. Uh, but in most cases, actually, you want a separate system for that. And so you know, what happens in that situation if you want to build a new index? Because you've got a new product feature, and you need to take your existing data, but somehow present it in a new way. And similarly, this stream of changes gives you exactly the tool that you need for that. Because you can start off with a brand new index server containing no data at all. It's completely empty. And you start it off at the beginning of the stream. And then you just churn through all of the messages in a single threaded manner very slowly until eventually you reach the head. And even if this takes a few days, that's not a problem. As long as we can keep the complete history of all of the changes that have happened here, we can run through this entire thing and we can build a new index which now is up to date with all of the data that ever happened. And so from like a data infrastructure and operational point of view, this is a wonderful thing to have. Now you can imagine this running as a background process. At the same time, the user is still reading from the old index. So that's why it doesn't matter if this process takes a while. It's just kind of a one-off batch process that you leave running for a while. And your operational systems are still being kept up to date here um, with the latest changes being fed in from the log. But at some point, the new index is up to date. And so at some point, you can then start switching users over to reading from the new index instead of from the old index. And then you can check, do your A-B tests, whatever, make sure that everything is working correctly. And eventually, you decide, OK, everything is working correctly. Now we can stop updating that old index. We no longer need it. And you can just throw it away. And so this has been like a really useful way of building these systems that can gradually migrate from one data system to another without downtime. Of course, this depends on keeping this complete history of all of the changes that ever happened. And uh, in, in certain low volume use cases, then it might actually be sufficient to simply keep literally all of the events. But in general, there'll be some situations in which that gets too expensive because we simply don't have infinite disk space. And so for that, Kafka has a feature called log compaction, which is kind of its, its only database-like feature, really. So Kafka doesn't have indexes or anything like that. It's really just like log files, streams of events that are stuck appended onto the end of files. But one thing it can do is if you have a key on events, in, in this case, each event has a key and a value. The key is A, B, or C. The value is a number. Um, Kafka can perform log compaction on this. And what that means is that it guarantees that it will keep at least the most recent message for a given key. If there are several different messages with the same key, then it's allowed to throw away older messages for that particular key. But the most recent message for a key is kept forever until, at some point, a later message with the same key appears, or unless that message is explicitly deleted. And so what this means is that eventually the size of this log actually compacts down to be proportional to the number of keys in the database, i.e. the size of the database. It's no longer proportional to the number of updates that have ever happened. It's only proportional to the size of the database. And well, Kafka keeps all of this stuff on disk anyway. So if you can keep it in a database, you can also keep it in Kafka. And then once you've got it there, well, you can do this index building and building downstream systems. Um, and feed it into your analytic systems and do your stream table joins and so on. So all of these things become very nicely possible now. And so that kind of just leaves the operators of stream processing. So now that we've taken these activity streams like page view events and we've taken the database change events like these profile edit events, we've put them all in streams. So now we can operate on them in a uniform way. So we can write these operators which, like, for example, perform a map operation. So on every message they see, they'll potentially transform it into some other message or filter out messages that they don't want. 
And so you can now start producing these derived streams where, for example, you filter down to only those where x is greater than 10, to give a stupid example, or multiply each by 2, whatever you want. Or uh, you can perform aggregations. Now, this is aggregations in the database sense, not in the DDD aggregate sense, although it's somewhat related, I guess. Uh, like, for example, the number of messages you've seen with a particular key. And, and so what stream processing frameworks, like SAMSA, the one that I worked on, what they do is they give you tools for writing these kind of operators. So the, the streams are provided by Kafka. And the implementation of these operators you can do in a stream processing framework. Of course, we're talking about these high volume streams here. So they also need to be scalable. Um, but the way that is done is simply by input partition. So we've got each partition here. Like each individual partition can handle maybe, say, 10 megabytes per second order of magnitude throughput. Um, but you can horizontally scale that by just having as many partitions as, across as many servers as you want. And now each processor will take the, the events that happen on exactly one partition and just process them in a single threaded way. And because each message is quick to process, you know, all you've got to do is increment a counter or write it to an index. You're not like sending emails based on every single message. And so this is feasible to run in a single threaded way. But then the output could be fanned out to many different partitions of the output streams. And so this allows you to do regrouping type things. So if you want to make sure that all of the messages with a certain key appear in the same partition, you can have a job like this which repartitions and effectively routes them to the correct destination. And then a second stage, which then actually processes all of the messages with the same key. And this allows us to build these kind of uh, systems quite nicely. If we want to do this joins of several streams, we can do that with these partition streams as well by co-partitioning. So we make sure that all of the page view events for user 1 appear in partition 1 of this stream. And we make sure that all of the profile edit events for user 1 appear in partition 1 of the profile edit stream. So that means partition 1 contains all of the data for user 1. And similarly, like user 5,300 will maybe be in partition 3 or whatever. And now the processing can then simply be partitioned so that, well, partition 1 of this, of the profile edits, and partition 1 of the page views get routed to the same task. And now this task is, again, just a single threaded process which is going to sit there, turning through all of the events, and it sees page views, and it sees profile updates. And so it can maintain its little local copy of the index can, that index contains now only the profiles for the users within that particular partition. So now we've taken our hundreds of millions of users and broken them down into manageable chunks. But we can still be sure that we'll see all the right events because we've routed all of the events for the same user to the same processing task. And now this is really the kind of stuff that these stream processing, these distributed stream processing frameworks help with. Um, this little a database here in which you can maintain, for example, that index of profiles is provided by an embedded database such as RocksDB, which is this thing that Facebook open source. And, and so it lives actually within the same JVM process as, as, this, uh, as the actual stream processing task. So access to this thing is very fast. Now, it's also not very fault tolerant, because if you lose this processing machine, you lose the local state that was stored there. But actually, that's fine, because we designed this whole thing so that we can restore the state of the log of events. And so in the worst case, if you lose the data, well, no problem. You just spin it up on a new machine, process that long history of, um, of events that we logged in Kafka, and thus you can restore the state that you lost here again. And so this is really where I see these interesting parallels, where um, in DDD, using events for the, purposes, for the purpose of modeling a business domain and really understanding what is going on in a business domain and reducing complexity there. And so that helps us understand the business logic part of the system better. In parallel, it seems that people independently in this internet company's world have come up with a very similar looking idea uh, under their name of stream processing. Solving a very different problem, though, solving this problem of scaling large data systems. But I find it very interesting that these, uh, 
this, these similar ideas have appeared in two very different communities that seem to barely talk to each other, um, which suggests to me that maybe there's something fundamental underlying about this idea that makes it important. That's about as far as I am with my thinking. Other people have written lots about this, so you can, you can find the full list of references um, on the website where I've put up the slides. Um, more thinking about this also in the book, which is not finished yet, but you can find an early release on, of that, of the first eight or nine chapters on dataintensive.net if you're so inclined. And I hope we still have a few minutes for questions because I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you. How do we handle the ordering problem when it's co-partitioned? Yes, yes uh, good question. Um, so in this case, the, the ordering of events across two different partitions actually is not defined. So there's, there's nothing in Kafka that says this event in this partition happened before or after this event in this other partition. So there's no ordering information there. Uh, so by default, what these things will simply do is asynchronously consume both streams, and you'll end up with some kind of random interleaving. So it's, it's arbitrary at that point. Um, and for these kind of analytics type use cases, uh, whether a profile change happened just before or after a particular page view is normally not particularly important. And so in that case, this non-determinism is actually acceptable. Um, what I have been looking into recently actually is techniques for giving stronger ordering guarantees here. And so you have to be kind of careful there to not destroy the scalability of the system because if you had to pump all of the events through a single CPU core, then this would grind to a halt. Um, so some of the stuff I'm researching at the moment is actually about providing stronger ordering guarantees across different partitions um, using effen effectively a kind of time slicing approach. So you could define uh, slices across all partitions which saying, okay, all of these correspond to one logical point in time. And then you know that uh, messages before and after that checkpoint have to be ordered correctly across all partitions. And so that gives you a a certain granularity. You could do these checkpoints once per second, for example, so that, that way it's not a big overhead on the infrastructure, but it still gives you reasonably good granularity of ordering. The yeah, question was, how reliable is the persistence on Kafka? Um, it's been gradually developing over time. So it was originally design, designed for these kind of web server log aggregation purposes, where you know if you lose 1% of your messages, it's actually not a big deal. And so like the first version of, uh, of Kafka didn't actually have any replication, uh, so every broker was a single point of failure, effectively. But what's been interesting is that as um, companies like LinkedIn and others have been developing more operational experience with Kafka and it's become more mature, actually its durability expectations have been gradually increasing as well. And so the state it's at now is that every message gets synchronously replicated across multiple brokers. Uh, you can tune the exact replication factor and how many synchronous acknowledgements it waits for. But you know, that's in terms of replication strength, that's already uh, on the level of many relational databases, replication systems. Um, and some of the stuff I'm looking at the moment is about uh, adding integrity proofs to Kafka so that uh, the system can actually prove cryptographically that all of the data is there and correct. And so it can be continuously audited that way. Um, some other people are also looking into adding transaction support for Kafka, which would allow you to atomically publish messages to several different partitions as one atomic action and get a definite commit or abort on that. And so um, this is still, it's still fairly young technology, so I won't oversell it, definitely. Um, but it's, the trend is definitely that it's been moving towards <coughs> these more and more like database-like guarantees. And so LinkedIn, for example, has this um, internal document database called Databus. Uh, and it's now actually using Kafka for its cross data center replication. And you know, that's really a situation where you can't afford to lose any messages at all because it's, it's database replication. It has to be totally correct. So it's been gradually moving to those more and more stronger type use cases. Yes, please. Did you experience uh, stop Uh, stop the world GC problems. So, uh, well, with, 
RocksDB that we're using there particularly, it uh, uses JNI for off heap. So um, that the memory use there actually doesn't affect the GC times or the JVM. Um, as a kind of more general point, like yes, sometimes people have problems with pauses with, uh, with, with long GC pauses, which um, is most critical, of course, in online systems, which are serving user traffic, where actually users get error messages if your system is GCing. Um, most of the stream processing things we've been building have been these kind of not quite online systems where the, we have maybe some latency expectations of normally get messages through the pipeline within a second, say um, occasionally we can tolerate it spiking up to 30 seconds. And so in that case, is, uh, having a GC pause somewhere actually isn't all that critical um, because the, the system has been designed to accept a certain amount of latency anyway. Yes, please. I had a question. So we're actually, where I'm working, they're considering using Kafka for the business events. And I guess my question is, in that example you gave about people viewing profiles, you're saying don't have all that information. You know, have like maybe a reference to a profile ID that you can look it up. In terms of that augmentation of data, do you use like these sort of code things, or can you talk up something like Spark or Pentel, which I've heard about, just to the Kafka screen, and then it can just can make, someone else can make sense of it, maybe like a data scientist. Um, so what was the question about embedding the denormalized data in the events or about the joining? Yeah, can, do you have to write code for these joins or the tools that you can hook up to things like, I don't only know a little bit about them like Pentel and Spark, mm. can they do all that kind of work for you in a way? Like, is it, is it? Yes, so there's, there's kind of different tools for that people are using and developing there. It's, it's a quite a fast moving area actually. So um, if you want to do these kind of uh, joins there, uh, like, I don't know, say this kind of thing. Um, if you implement that as an, as an operator with SAMHSA, the system I talked about, then you actually write code to do that. So it's quite a, quite a manual process. Um, there are efforts to make nicer, higher level tools where you can just somehow say declaratively say, okay, I want to join this stream with this stream on this particular key. And it generates these operators automatically internally. Um, and so Spark is doing some area in that. Samza is actually adding support for SQL, uh, SQL queries, which get compiled down to these kind of operators. Okay. Um, so that's, it's, it's a rapidly evolving area. I think over the next few years, we'll probably see a lot more of that. So it's, at the moment, a lot of these tools are quite low level and deliberately so because they're trying to become really operationally robust at the low level before adding fancy, fancy high level features uh, and then gradually moving up to higher levels. Uh, one at the back, please. Yeah, uh, one question. Uh, you are, uh... um, so my, my instinct is that uh, things like Kafka are designed to be used in a distributed setup from the start for full tolerance as much as anything else. So, um, so if you run it on just a single node, I think the, the benefits would be limited. Um, but if you start running it across two or three servers and just not even partitioning the data, but just replicating it, then at least you're taking advantage of that replication already. Um, and at, at that point, it starts maybe becoming interesting. And actually, um, two or three servers will be enough for many use cases. Like there's some benchmarks pushing, I think, two million messages per second through three servers. Uh, and they're not expensive servers, just kind of standard, small rack-mounted ones. So. Um, at that point, it, I guess it comes down to like, to what degree do you want to be uh, exploratory with technology? Because the, these are totally admittedly, these are still young, fairly immature tools. Um, you can get some interesting benefits from them, but it, it won't be as smooth riding as just using a standard relational database, say. Uh, so I, I, I think it's probably worth starting to look at these things and just kind of starting to think about use cases where you might use them, but I wouldn't like jump on it immediately and start doing everything this way. <coughs> yes, please. Uh, at LinkedIn, of course, I realize the profile, but I've changed that often. But in other scenarios, you might have uh, more uh, volatile data. And, and, and with that setup, you always get the stale data from the uh, profile. So with the page view event, it comes in, and then you, you look up the profile, and then you enrich it. But you don't know if the <laughs> Yes, 
Yeah, so that's, it's fundamentally asynchronous. Yeah. Um, there's, there's not very much you can do about that without really coupling systems very closely and synchronously together. Well, the, the key is you would need somehow some linearizable queries to an external system. Uh, so like if, if that's super critical to you and you're willing to pay that latency cost of making a query to an external system, then sure, you can do that. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, for the kind of the, the middle ground where like you want certain guarantees, but you don't want to make a network request for every single query, that then comes back to what we're discussing about ordering. So there, if you can then enforce some message ordering across different partitions, then you could say, OK, this particular point in time, uh, we know that the, um, say the, the page view event happened before the profile edit event, or it happened after the profile edit event. So in that case, you know uh, there's a well-defined ordering, and so you have to process them in the correct order in the consumer then. So that, that starts becoming possible if that ordering information is reflected explicitly. Uh, sorry, that was last question. Last question? Uh, okay, so I'll be around, so feel free to come and talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you.